Uh, just introduce myself, I'm Andy Muir, I'm the CEO of CoachLogic, and we're a video analysis and feedback platform. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm based in, in Scotland, so I'm in Edinburgh, so it's, uh, it's night time over here, uh, and obviously Gary's based in, uh, in California there, uh, eight hours behind. Um, so yeah, so it's, we're sort of kind of spanning, spanning the, well, a little part of the world anyway, which is nice. But um, yeah, really, first up, uh, thanks so much to Gary for taking the time to do this. Um, I'm really looking forward, every time I speak to Gary, I'm always left enthused by uh, his uh, passion for the game and, and for coaching as well. So I think for everyone out there, um, there's a lot to be learned from what Gary is going to share with us tonight. And as I said, I, for one, I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, just if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to fire them through the chat. I've got a couple of questions already sent through in advance. So um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from Gary. Over to you, Gary. All right. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for um, for taking time out of their day and um, listening to this. So I'm, I'm obviously going to talk about creating a, a soccer-specific culture. It's more in, in terms of what we've done here at Cal State Bakersfield. It's it's by no means bulletproof at all, but it's just to draw on our experiences um, over the past 24 months. Um, and like I said, it's uh, cultures come in all different shapes and sizes, and um, and it's got to be authentic. And, and this is just uh, what we've tried to do on the soccer side of things. So um, feedback. You know, is always is always appreciated and welcome, and and a, and a dialogue would always be appreciated as well. So, look forward to chatting and uh, and hearing some uh, questions at the end. So, I will start. Um, let's see. With um, with why cult culture is a, a huge buzzword at the minute with coaches, and if you I think if you ask a college coach in any sport what is the key to success, I think within probably two two sentences they'll they'll mention something about culture. So. Um, you know, I, I wanted to identify why that's the case, especially for from people who are not in the United States or not familiar with the college system over here. So, why culture is so important, in, in my opinion, is that there's there's four aspects to a student athlete's life over here, um, which is their specific sport, obviously soccer in this case, um, strength and conditioning programs, which is the weight room, academics, and then in the community. So. We are our players are you know have to be we do not have to fall they're not full time athletes first and foremost um, and they are students first and foremost so we don't have full time access to them um, and NCAA rules which is the governing body over here uh, restricts us from a certain amount of hours even a certain amount of time during the year to working with them so we spend I would say you know our players spend twenty percent in their sport. Maybe, 30% of their time in their sport and, and the majority of their time is spent in these other areas. So culture is important because uh, the stronger our players, the stronger our culture is and the more consistent it is across the board, then you have a better chance of impacting uh, on the pitch performance when it actually happens. So if you can, you know, if you can drive a culture which is to, to create better leaders or create better students or better athletes, then they should in turn become better players. So so culture is um, is a big, big part of college sports and a big, big part of being successful. So um, again, from from us at Bakersfield, we arrived here, coaching staff here in 2014, uh, and this was a list of goals just that we had. Uh, obviously, create a winning culture. Uh, we look for success on and off the field. So in the classroom, how our players were perceived in the community as well was also very important to us. And um, making sure they were doing the right things off the field. We wanted to be good on the training pitch and we wanted to win games, so improving team performance. So that was, a, I suppose, a culture outline that we set when we first got here. This was, or these were the words that, that we kind of, you know, threw onto the team initially. We wanted a, you know, a strong group to be together, to be tight. Um, we wanted aggressive and committed players. Um, attention to detail on and off the practice pitch was going to be very important. And then, you know, attack minded, forward thinking, not just on the field, but off the field as well. So we wanted players to be, you know, they have to deal with setbacks or solve problems. We wanted that to be the case that they would they would work very, very hard at that there. Um, so all these things every day, you know, we spoke to the players about that there, attention to detail in the classroom, attention to detail with uh, with listening to um, to instructions and tactical information. Um, committed to your sport, committed to the lifestyle, committed to the, you know, the, the weights, everything. These words were probably the most used that, that our players heard every day 
for our first six months. We came in in March. Our, our season starts in August, so we had literally five to six months to work on this here. Recruitment wasn't a big part because we had just missed the window of signing day. So everything came to like, this is our squad and, and this is the message that we wanted to get through. So our first, like, all the advice I got starting a new program and or starting with a new program was all get the culture right, get the culture right. So this was a list of what we tried to do. Um, then, you know, towards the, when the games were starting up, we then looked at what's our on the field uh, performance going to look like. And this was, you know, based on the players we had, based on the teams we had and, and the strength of the, of the group. You know, we put together that you know, we wanted to be defensively solid. We, we, had, we had conceded a lot of the goals in the pro, in the years before that. Um, we wanted to be compact, hard to beat, um, play a little bit deeper. We lacked a bit of pace up front, so we didn't our place at the back, so we needed a bit of cover. Um, we were going to be primarily a counter-attacking team and rely on one or two forwards to, to try and get us some goals. We wanted to be aggressive in small spaces. Um, physical, and we were going to be direct. Um, we weren't going to to play through the, the channels. We were going to we were going to um, go from front to back pretty quickly. So those were the areas of our tactical plan. In accordance, then combined with our culture, we felt pretty confident going into the season that, that we had done the work. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the game by game play, but but this was just um, this was this was the first game. So Gonzaga were a very very good team, and they came to. To our home, and this is what we looked like. We had one forward press, and this was 15 minutes into the game, not even one forward press. This was our midfield four, as you can see, not very compact. Two pressing, one dropping, and one out of place. Um, and now the back four, I think one presses, one drops, one presses, then drops, and the other comes across. We're at literally sixes and sevens, um, and we get exposed, and our defender uh, give away. Penalty, obviously, but uh, and was lucky to stay on the feet. So we went to goal down after 14 minutes, an awful start to the game. We got back in the game, and then we were seconds away from getting a great result. And this was almost 15 seconds to go. We had to defend a corner, defended the first ball. One player steps up to press, and the rest of our player, nine players in the box, then have a decision to make. Do they press? Do they drop? Um, they did neither. And... Ball keeper makes a good save, comes off the crossbar, squared, and in the net, and we lose it with uh, 13 seconds left. Um, so obviously that was that was a tough blow. So this was a pretty consistent message throughout our whole season. Key moments and crucial moments, our players were not thinking um, in a system together or working together, um, and we you know we were scratching our heads and saying, well, we think that we're doing the right things off the pitch, and why is the message not coming on the pitch? It seems to be a performance problem. So. We looked closely at the culture and then we looked at the play model and, and this is what we came from. Was it a consistent message? Um, so if you see on the left, this is the culture, the words we used every day in training, the classroom, the gym, together, committed, aggressive. Uh, and then we looked at what we're asking to do on the field, which was to be defensive minded. Um, and we found out that we were asking them almost a, an opposite on the pitch of what we were asking them to do off the pitch. So our tactical plan was was very much structured against our culture and not alongside our culture. So all those, you know, all those things on the left or all the players are nodding their heads, nodding their heads. Comes a Friday night or a Sunday, and our players have to go. Uh, not sure about that. That's not what we're about. Um, so what that led to was, uh, you know, our source of the problem. Our culture did not mirror our state of play. It was the, in fact, the exact opposite. Uh, it sent mixed signals to our players. So we would work. Our structure on the training field, our sessions were good, but they were not relevant to what way we wanted to play, I felt. Um, so we got compliance without commitment, and by that I mean our players agreed, and they said, yeah, I'm going to do it. But they, they didn't really, really commit to going above and beyond in that there, and, and our evaluation of it was that if, if the soccer culture is not set, uh, which ours wasn't, and it's not strong enough, which ours wasn't, the players will define it in their own way. Um, and what does that mean? Well, they define it in their own way that if we're going to say that we're attack minded and, and we're going to be aggressive and then on Sunday we say, right, we're going to drop, we're going to play counter attack in soccer, then our, our players are saying, well, you don't really believe in me. Um, and we're telling them and we're trying to get confidence in them throughout the week. And then we're saying, right, but you've got to hold back slightly because we're not aggressive enough to step in a game. And, and the players take that there or we felt that they took that there as um, as a negative and, and it impacted performance. So what we had was a situation where we had to redefine the goal of our culture. 
So rather than setting it up where if we took care of it off the field, it would take care on the field, we, we redefined it as, as they both had, had to work alongside each other. So our goal was then to have players share a common purpose and working hard in the same direction both on and off the field. There had to be there had to be a connection between what we were doing with our playing style and what we were asking them to do off the field. So um, again, I was kind of inspired by a, a quote by uh, Mr. Mourinho, at a certain time faced with a certain situations, all the players must think in the same way. And I think that's really important because when the players, when it comes to pressure situations and it comes to fatigue, and both of those are, are almost the you know, pillar, pillars of Division One life, our players go through a lot of pressure, and our players are are are, are stretched in the fatigue area. Um, they're all going to do different things if they're not on the same page on and off the field. So if we can get these players thinking together, and when they're in the weights room, they know what the message is, and when they're on the train field, they know what the message is, and when they're on the team bus, they know what the message is. We feel that if we could get that message to be consistent with what we wanted to do on the field, we would have a better chance of success. So we decided that our, our main focus point of us as a staff was to embed the play model into our culture. So how we were actually going to play, how our system was going to, you know, was going to be to be defined. Um, we had to define it, establish it, communicate it, and improve it. Those were the four areas that we set up to to tackle this issue. So um, could we could we actually, you know, um, I suppose define what, what the players wanted, what the coaches wanted, and, and could we get to a stage where it became a process that we were continually working at this area. So how did we do that, D defining it? Um, we brought in an absolute uh, sign of the season was um, Donna Fister, who's a, a team specialist, um, and she, she works with a lot of college programs, and she was phenomenal, and she specialised in this area of culture. Um, we brought her in, she spent three days on campus um, and what she did was she basically um, you know she, she turned the model from a coach driven model to where we said this is what we're going to be about and she moved it to like this is what the players want what do you guys want from this experience what do you want as a team what do you want to look as in, in all these different places so a lot of work went into these areas in the three or four days and and because our team was very very young and because our team was very inexperienced in this um, Donna had to drill very hard, so her first her first meeting with the team where we're establishing culture and, and a foundation of what we want to be about, I think her first meeting was over six hours long, so you know it was very, very difficult, uh, and uh, they found it difficult as well because, like I said, they weren't allowed generalizations, they weren't allowed to just say, we want to be a good team or we want to be successful, they had to go deep to find exactly what they wanted to be about and were they going to hold each other accountable. Um, what were they passionate about, uh, and and to be genuine about that, and not just say what the coaches wanted to hear, uh, and it was a long process. Uh, like I said, the the first meeting set a set a standard almost, and like we're not going to leave this room until we we move and we progress into what we want to talk about. So that picture uh, below was was Donna in the classroom, and and that's what she spent. Like I said, three days doing, and, and our, our players did a lot of work and, and a lot of soul searching, I suppose. Um, she then targeted leadership because with any culture, you're obviously only going to be as good as the leaders in it. Um, we would all like to think that it's down to the coaches, but it's the more that we, we delved into this here, the more we realized that it's not down to the coaches, it's down to the leadership group, the, the players who are going to, to communicate this to the, to the rest of the team every day. So. What she, she did with the leadership group, communication, she made us look at communication right across the board, uh, evaluate, self-evaluate, see whether it was effective means, see whether, how did we you know, communicate this, how was this communicated. The players had to earn, the, or the, the leadership group had to earn the trust of the players, we had to earn the trust of the leadership group, and, and it, was, it was very, very interesting and, and quite an intense experience. Both had to be pretty flexible in what they were doing. Um, and it was all driven towards the process. Every day uh, we went after this here and, and you know there were difficult conversations and there were tough conversations and there was plenty of an uncomfortable conversations. But in order for us to get to the model of the players taking ownership for this, um, this was a very, very, very important process. And, and Donna did an unbelievable job. So once we were out of that stage where the players had defined what they wanted and were pretty comfortable in each other in terms of getting to where they wanted to go. Um, 
this is what we, we almost redefined from a culture standpoint in terms of relationships and social cohesion, which are very, very important in any group. So, you know, this is what we want. That it, it's not really rocket science when it comes down to, you know, any form of teams that are that are hungry and that want to be successful. Um, but one or two of the things that, that that probably were big points for us that hadn't been said before was um, you know, the respect for everyone's role and the, the environment. Everyone wanted to come in every day and, and enjoy this year. So it had to be part of the criteria. It had to be that we were going to you know, we were going to fail together, we were going to succeed together, but we would enjoy the road. So that was that was very much a player driven process. Um, then the reason for I suppose what you would test the culture with is is the culture strong enough to deal with you know thunderbolts almost so bad losses team selection who plays who doesn't what if a big personality comes onto the team what if a big personality leaves the team from graduation or injury um, conflict a, a daily occurrence in any competitive team is going to be conflict and when you have 25 plus players 30 plus players you are going to have behavioral problems and issues so all these here test the culture every day and our thing was is our culture going to be strong enough to deal with you know if we lose the first game of the season do we rip up this thing and say it doesn't work or are we going to be you know is it a process where we commit to it as coaches as leaders and as players so that was that was part of it as well we didn't uh, we didn't paint this picture as a as a uh, rainbows and and all that good stuff. We knew it was going to be difficult, but this was going to test it, uh, and and had the you know had the potential to make it even stronger. So that was the player. The players had played a big role in that. Then the responsibility of the coaching staff was to establish it, communicate it, and then improve it. So establish a playing model. How were how was that culture going to transfer onto the field, and how was that going to look? Um, again, this was a, a quote that I, I kept by myself all the time, every time I was planning sessions and talking to the staff about what we wanted to do on the training pitch. The most important thing is knowing how you want to play and knowing how to train to get it. And, and these are two different things because I felt at the start that we knew how we wanted to play, but we didn't train how we were going to do that. Um, so we, we, you know, again, a bit of soul searching from the coaching staff and looking and making sure everything we did on the field, or everything we do on the field has to be um, has to complement what we are going to be about every single thing. So um, the functions of the play model were pretty simple. Um, again, you've probably seen these points: defensive organization, transition from attack into defensive attack, transition from the attack into four moments in the game. Um, and could our players be comfortable in the decision making process? And could they be comfortable in executing what we were asking them to do? Um, again, just a, uh, the model. This is what what it is, and it, again, you've probably seen that there. But these, this was we we threw everything in that we became obsessed by our training model. You know, if it, you know, what what are, why are we doing this, and does it have an impact on how we're going to play? Which in then does it have an impact on how we want the team to feel about how we're playing? Um, the biggest problem uh, wasn't a referee. Uh, it's the fact that we didn't have enough time. So. Every coach complains that they don't have enough time. I think at college, it becomes even harder because you've got a a two week season uh, pre season, sorry, and then you're straight in the game. So, did we have enough time to embed this tactical model, you know, in the pre season process? And then when the game start and the thunderbolts start, was that tactical model strong enough to get us through? And it wouldn't be. I I don't think it is, and I didn't feel this at the time. So this was around. May June of this year when it's when we're talking about this and um, we got a lot of work on the tactical side from a, from an analyst in, in Ireland, uh, Paddy McCarthy, and Paddy was giving us a lot of feedback on um, decision making and what the tactical model should look like. Um, so then we went we went looking for a platform and Paddy suggested Coach Logic. So I'll just transfer this real quick. What Coach Logic did was. Uh, Andy and the guys, you know, explained that this was a, a model and a platform that could communicate and give feedback to our players in a number of issues. So we set about then building a block, and, and I'm, I'm not going to show you every aspect of it here in, in the interest of time. But you know, in the play model, how would we communicate that with the players? Well, if we started in pre-season, I felt it would be too it would be too late. Um, you know, so we started this at the start of the summer. 
and our play model would then be communicated uh, and everyone would be, the goal was for everyone to be comfortable with what it was before they arrived. So every week we sent out one of these videos um, which was going to explain exactly what our play, this was an introduction so I'll just, I'll, I'll show you this here quite quickly. Um, again, I, I talk into a form of possession of the ball. So when we do, I'm not going to let that run uh, in the interest of time. So we broke the possession phase into three areas. Um, this was what we wanted to do on the ball, and and you know instead of being direct, this you know our players wanted to play an exciting brand of soccer. So we had to build from the back, um, and we would have a model in doing that there. So we broke it down to three areas: phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one was the build-up phase coming from the goalkeeper and in the midfield positions of, of starting positions of players. Phase two was how did we work through the midfield into the final third. Um, again, key positions, key relationships, what it looked like, what we tried to do. Did we try and switch? Did we try and, and, and pass in, a different, um, in different patterns? Uh, and then phase three was the final third phase, which is obviously the fun stuff, uh, scoring goals and trying to get our players into these areas where, you know, and teaching the system, could we break it down into these three areas and could we be consistent with where it's going wrong or how it needs fixed. So we, you know, how, we have then, how could the players play a role in that there? And, and we, you know, as you can see here, understand the system, be fit enough to excel in it and then have the technical ability to perform your function in it. So those were the three things. So the part of the player summer workout was, you had to know this system or you had to know what our DNA was going to be on the field off by heart by the time you came in here. Um, and again, we, we sh all these things, as you can see here, the phases, build up, build up wide, roll of the six and eight. Um, I'll just show you this in, in terms of how specific we went into it. So this would have been our holding midfielder, um, which we asked to be a little bit more um, mobile than maybe had been before, we off, then we, we asked the, the holding midfielder to be to be competent in three areas on the ball. So this was, you know, area number one was to be an option for the centre backs and to try and release the full backs. So that was the first option that our, our holding midfielder had to be good at, um, which would be the most basic. The second one with our system, we were looking for width. So we wanted our holding midfielder to be able to switch the point of attack try and find players and, and we asked them to do this in two different ways or, or give them the option to do it in two different ways. One was off the dribble, which I think this one is here. Yeah, driving forward, um, coming out of the pocket and finding feet in a 1v1 situation out wide. The second was the old fashioned open up, switch to play. Um, as you can see here, I think uh, this is Haley Vicente. She just gets it from, uh, from her fullback um, and she just opens up and then she realizes what well, what's on and processes it pretty quickly and switches the point of attack uh, to create the 1v1 again which is what we're looking for and the third one was was to play forwards all the time if you had if you had space to penetrate penetrate and work alongside the center forwards so um, we would ask for a center forward to give us that depth and we would ask for our holding midfielders that if they did not have a player on her back where you can see her checking her shoulder there if she had space in front of her to take uh, we wanted our holding midfielder to be able to do that there um, and be able to play forward passes into those areas so uh, for center forwards who we would hopefully get to stretch the play. So that was an area that again we looked specifically at um, the role of the center, the, the holder or sorry the number eight. We then looked to find space in front so there's another quick clip um, get in front of the back four on the opposition and try to create goal scoring chances, uh, which that almost was. So that was something that we looked, like I said, our model that we could do, we could use this system. So when we put the system up online, our players would get a message, we'd get an email, um, and then they could go up and, and have a look at it. We would then call them and ask them if it went to specific positions and say, all right, how did you feel about this? As we progressed, um, as we progressed throughout the season and improving it, uh, it became a bit more specific, so defensive organization was still a summer theme. Throw-ins was a, was a sin season. We, we, we give away, we, we tended to close ourselves off in possession. We tended to go back to areas that we came from, from throw-ins. So we wanted to highlight that area. Uh, and then it became more specific to oppositions. As you can see there, New Mexico was 
was beat the block, how we were going to beat a low block. Um, and UMKC was we felt that if we if we allowed switches, we would give ourselves more pressing to do, which we weren't too happy with. Um, and then outside backs and specifically individuals. So when we looked at that there, the, the play model, um, we then had to, so once we looked at a tactical system, we then had to improve that there by being, um, by going into games. So when we went into games, um, giving our team more feedback and, and how did we run this during the season? Um, let's see if I go to, these are all the games, these are all the videos that are up for the players to take a look at. So. During the game, I would sit and watch, and, and this platform, a coach logic, allows you to break down and, and go through a game uh, pretty easily. And then you can you can basically give the player, uh, so say, great step, Anessa. So this is probably our player, uh, our left back, stepping. She's going to press pretty high, probably in the next pass. Uh, yeah, there she is, steps, wins the ball, and we play. And then I can comment alongside this, uh, caught out of position here, Mel. Don't press the ball when you have a player behind her. So this is... A clip of one of our players getting caught out in possession. Um, if it plays, or this one plays. Oh, for some reason it's stuck. Uh, right foot pass here. So uh, again, questioning why she, or why our left back passed this one with her right foot, which uh, never goes down well with left-footed players. So um, these were just things. So a player could watch the game, and we could talk to the players. This was a, a, a form of. I suppose an initial form of feedback was instead of sitting every player in a room and going through um, 20 meetings, player meetings, uh, we, we tended to focus more on um, informal feedback where we could use this and say like every position, you can see little clips, I could watch this all day, uh, I don't know what this is, probably a, probably a big tackle, no it's a free kick that she's uh, walloped in the back of the net. Um, so when, when we did this here, we felt that the players could, if they wanted to come in and check out how they did, but we, as, as you can see on the right side of the screen, we viewed it by important areas of our playing model, which was pressure, switches, uh, and then positional work and set pieces, which um, became more and more important all season. So then on top of that there, what we also did was we looked then if, if the players, we focused more on decision making in this model, if a player came out and made 20 technical errors in the, in the game, I would not write them an essay on each one and say, don't let the ball run under your foot, or when you're going to control it, don't let that happen. Um, we focused more on decision making because the decision making component was directly related to the style of play. So we felt that if we could get the players more confident in the style of play, they would make those decisions quicker and they would be more confident when they step on the field. So this is just an example of of three, I think this is our, our left back who, who had a phenomenal season, but there was one game that she made three, uh, I suppose, critical mistakes for her position. Uh, this was one where, where she had great initial pressure to the ball, and then she decides to drop off. Uh, but in doing that there, we would have rather that she stayed. So when she drops off there, we would rather that she stayed in that position, because when she drops off, she allows the attacker to play forward. Our defenders expected her to press that because she had done it all year uh, and they're caught as flat as you can and we had a lucky escape on that. Somehow she didn't score and we survived. So about 10 minutes later in the game, another decision-making component uh, from the same player, this time left back. You can see her, her position's pretty good. She's a pacey player so she can take care of the right forward but she suddenly steps um, to a ball that she's never going to win and all of a sudden she leaves the right forward uh, and creates a massive problem and somehow we survived that one as well. Uh, again, somehow that was a pretty good chance. And then the third situation was, was more a decision in possession of the ball where this is our left midfielder who's on the counter attack who decided that she was going to go 1v1 and our left back decided that she was going to overlap it and then she gets caught out. So she's tried to overlap in the transition phase um, and then gets caught out, then has to make the, you know, her feet there, she had a position and may not be a penalty, but we didn't get away with that one and it came to, uh, it came to a goal against us. So when we're looking at improving that, we're sending that there to the player and saying, all right, you know, what do you think of these situations? What do you think of these decisions? And we follow that up with, uh, with meetings and, and then, you know, as much as specific feedback as we could do. Um, and then all of a sudden then, you know, in, in a culture of anything, I think 
when we ask that of the players, they're accountable to every every time we go on the practice field. And, and again, if, if you scroll down this here, they're also accountable to getting better. So we wanted them to, to be familiar in modeling their, their, their performance on other things. So, uh, for example, if there was something that we saw online that we liked, we would add this to the to the uh, coach logic. This was Diego Costa, I think, where um, he was pretty aggressive, and yeah, we wanted our centre forwards to play like Diego Costa, as anyone would. Uh, but we wanted to give them, you know, could they see what we were asking for and just say, here, sitting them down in front of an 80-minute game. We would also then say, right, um, if they wanted to go out and work extra on their work, uh, we give them, you know, there was there was a there was a system there where they could do. They could practice. There was exercise. There's exercises in the system where they could be all right. I can go out, work on this on my own. Work on with four players, five players. Try and get better. Try and get better. Check to the ball. Check away. Move away. All these things that, um, like I said, if you're trying to create a culture of accountability, a massive part I believe in that culture of accountability is people trying to get better every day. So it's not necessarily if you win or lose. It's necessarily whether are you trying to get better or are you not. Um, again, if you look at this here. Uh, we went through practice sessions were videoed as well, and if there was parts of the practice that we this was in the spring, I believe um, this was forwards with their back to goal. It should be played, yeah. Keep the possession and move on, and then try to get in an attacking position higher up the field. So um, the players then had a responsibility that they were trying to get better, and they could understand it. I would say it accelerated the view of our play model to our practice. Players could see the connections. Um, if I wanted to stop a session and say, all right, you didn't check to that ball, she got a visual right away because she's been watching videos on this for the past three to four months. Um, so it, it took out a lot, of, um, a lot of time on the practice pitch with cones and a lot of time with sitting the group down and saying, this is what we want to try to create. We did all that, I suppose, off the field. We did all that with a visual because I think two things I think are important. I think the visual is important. I think a player has to see exactly what you're asking them to do, and I think the second one is that they have to they have to feel as if they can do it, and they have to see themselves doing it. So I was a coach in the past that you know if you wanted to play a possessional game, I would send out videos of Barcelona all day and ask the team to watch them, and then ask the team to come into practice the next day and try to play like that, and then become frustrated whenever we. Uh, didn't do it, um, but when you find yourself then in a video in a video setting, you know we, we complain about our players not wanting to watch videos and not becoming engaged by it. Um, but we're, I, I think that tends to happen when we ask them to watch other teams and other players. Um, in our experience here, when we've asked players to watch themselves, they tend to enjoy that more than and watching Messi. Barcelona or even Diego Costa. So the stuff that we give them that is outside our own team is is a small percentage of what it is uh, and a small percentage of what we're trying to achieve. So whenever we go to then, are we exempt from it as coaches? Then if we're asking the players to try and get better and we're asking the players to hold themselves accountable to it, um, we have a responsibility to our staff to do the same thing. So the, the platform also gave us you know, we would look at coaching sessions and we would throw the coaching sessions around and say, all right, uh, say this is a transitional session. Uh, we would log it up every night. The play, the staff can then look on this um, and then see, right, before training sessions, instead of walking out and discussing what we were going to do, um, they could look at, say, right, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Does, does this transition session fall into line with what we're trying to do on the pitch? Um, and if it didn't, then let's talk about it and improving it. Um, and then also then the resources of trying to get better would be how we organize our program and try to get players through fitness tests, recruiting, all that there, good stuff. So um, the coach logic has been really, really helpful in finding you know a, a way of communicating with players this year, just you can see, is, is trying to give some players feedback on, you know, if we see something in the game, do you want to stop by and chat about it, the clips? Um, and, and different aspects like that there. Um, and then I would say probably then, just I, I've tried to fly through that again, just in the interest of time. If you go to the team goals in the end, this was always the, the minimum and the, and the targets of what we're trying to achieve. The video room was, was an area that we tried to send them to try and, and 
accelerate that decision making process. Um, but I think, again, in, in just concluding it, I think that the players, a culture of accountability, and what we've tried to do has been that the accountability isn't, and a, and a powerful level of accountability is not a coach telling a player what to do. A powerful level of accountability is the players wanting to do something or the players demanding themselves in positions that we have to do this here, like forwards getting together and saying, all right, listen, we've got to, we've got to do a better job of this. So positional groups, teammates, um, influences within the, within the program, uh, that's a lot more powerful than, again, a compliant player will just nod at you and say, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this because you told me to do it. Um, but if you get the players to be like, all right, I, I believe in this and this is who I am, and you can then, again, align that with who they are as a student, who they are as an athlete, when they go in the gym then, they're not just going in the gym and doing weights and doing this here, they're trying to be more powerful athlete because if your play model is aggressive and pressing, uh, which ours turned out to be, we, we changed our play model from defensive and holding back and direct and we changed it to um, a possession model and we, we changed it to a pressing model because we felt that we had to do that in order to get our players excited about who they were and to get them in the gym and do extra work about trying to become quicker and stronger and faster, those three words that, uh, like it or not, play a massive role in American collegiate sports. So, um, yeah, this is what we try to do, and, and I just wanted to, to try and show that today uh, in terms of could you align a, a, a culture with a, a soccer platform and a system, and, and I think a lot of times as coaches, we view the culture as an outside the team, um, and too often enough, I think we spend 90% working on the culture and 10% working on the system, when you could say the system 90% impacts whether the culture is going to be a positive place to be or a negative place to be, because if you cannot perform on the field and you are a soccer team and you are here to try and win games, um, it would not be a good experience. So our players, we hope, have been excited about this and, and we can continue to build it. So. Again, I stress the process. We are nowhere near this here being over. Um, we feel that the, 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 the system itself can be better. Um, the execution can certainly be better, but we feel that from a physical standpoint, um, when, we, when we go up an extra level in the team, we can also improve the playing side as well. So um, that's what I've got today. I, I've tried to play through. I hope I wasn't too quick or I hope I wasn't too slow. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, that I could kind of communicate what we're trying to do within our culture and how much of an impact it had on the on the performance side and on the system that we tried to play. So I'm not sure if, if Andy's still on here. Um, yeah, still here, Gary, still here. Okay. That was, uh, yeah, that was excellent. Uh, thanks very much. I certainly, certainly enjoyed that. So um, we do have uh, some questions. So thanks very much to the guys who have sent those through. Uh, there's maybe sort of, you know, about six questions we'll go through at the moment, and if okay. there's any unanswered questions to those of you that have sent them in, then we can um, we can obviously answer those sort of after the, the webinar's finished and, and make sure we get an answer to you. So, but okay. I'll I'll start off one a short question um, from Armando, which is how was the leadership group selected? Yeah, great question. Um, again, uh, Donna wanted the coaches to select based on who we felt had, I suppose every, every you know, we're now in a, in a world where leaders are not as natural as they used to be for one reason or another, um, they're, they're not coming across as, you know, the, the John Terry's of this world are not really open coming to every program, so it has to be developed. I suppose what, you would, what Donna looked for was who we thought had potential to impact the group, um, and an impact she meant on and off the field, so were they going to play a big role on the field? and were they going to play a big role in the locker room. So when she asked for that, uh, we gave her six players who we felt uh, lived and breathed what we wanted to be about. Um, there were no issues in terms of fitness or performance or preparation with any of those players. Cool. Thanks, Gary. Okay, and uh, I guess a, a bit of a follow-up question from Andy. Um, if you've, you've got new players coming in each year, what are the challenges challenges that that presents, and who's who's most important, I suppose, across the playing or the, the coaching group to keep the culture strong? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's always, I mean, I, again, it's the the culture and, and culture is not a fixed 
you know, it, it's it very much it, it flows every day, and and, you, and everyone like the old saying, you have to fight for it every day. So, I think you've got to be very careful with your recruitment and the type of personalities because if you bring in, you know, the some I think the stronger a culture is, the more it can it can take and handle tough tough uh, characters or problem problematic characters. Um, but when a culture is young, you're looking for positivity and you're looking for um, players who want to be there. So that was uh, we had a young enthusiastic group and they they blended really really well into what we tried to do. Um, we had a caretaker of culture, I suppose, which uh, for me it. I found I don't think it. Some head coaches I think can do it. Uh, for ours, it's you know Clifton and Tory do a better job than me of getting closer to the players. Um, I as a head coach I, I keep a little bit of a distance, so they they are the heartbeat, or they they can hear or feel whether the what we need might be a little bit different from what we want to do, and and if the players have every week we met with the leadership group and, and again we had to win their trust with the first two weeks they wouldn't say anything to us but we, they opened up little by little and um, and hopefully now it's a situation where you know when talking about young players coming in we're hoping that we can get it to a stage where young players can transition and become I think you've got to be comfortable in the in the culture and I think we've done our, our program has done a better job of that but we're not there yet uh, so that's an area that we're looking to improve on. Cool, great. That's a good answer there. And I think that actually probably answered Neil sent in a question as well about the roles and duties of the, the other staff and assistant coaches, which I think you addressed there as well. Um, so, so that was good. And another question that's coming from James is, in your experience, what have you noticed are the, the biggest differences in culture potentially between female and male teams? Yeah, wow, what a question that is. Um... We we were right across the office from uh, our men's staff, Richie and Jerry. So and I, and I was right beside in both schools I worked at before Wingate and Cincinnati. We were right beside the coaches' offices. So I find that very interesting. I think, uh, in my opinion, the girls grasp the team aspect of it. Like they love the team aspect of it, and they they get a lot out of the team moving together and what's the best of the team and supporting the team. Um, and I think the higher the level with guys, the harder that is, because you're just you're just wired to. Uh, we 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 live in a little bit of a superstar culture when it comes to the men's side with the Ronaldos and the Messis, and it's about output and it's about it's maybe not as driven in the team ethos as it is individuals. So I think society makes it a bit more difficult on the men. So you have to do a little bit of extra work, and I think that's happening on the men's side and some of the old-fashioned stuff of. You know, coming together, spending more time together, I think is coming back on that side. Whereas in the girls, maybe it's more natural to do the the team bonding and the team, the unity, as is is always a, a cornerstone of preparation and preseason. Okay, cool. Um, right. So a slight slight change of tack. It's obviously about culture of accountability, but this one comes from Rob. Um, so he said from a very early age, um, and typically, sorry. We believe in the creation of a soccer-specific culture of accountability from a very early age, and typically parents are very supportive of this. That said, many parents still struggle to apply the same level of understanding to this culture of accountability when the going gets tough for their young player, I'm talking players around 13 or 14. Any thoughts as to how to improve parents' understanding and cultural buy-in even further? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard even at the college level. Like, you're only... I mean, and I don't want to come on here and, and sound as if our culture, you know, absolutely perfect here or great, because you're only one loss away from, you know, people pointing pointing fingers at, at maybe a decision that you made as a coach or maybe I should be playing. So, and I think as, again, society has, um, there's so many clubs now that when players are younger, if it doesn't work out for them, instead of uh, persevering and and gaining resilience by playing through a problem, they'll go somewhere else and they'll join another club and, and that's impacted the, the college level. Um, how do you fix that? It's, it's very difficult. I think that, you know, I think as coaches you, you have to you have to persevere, you have to hang your hat on this thing and say that this is non-negotiable, that, you know, it's not for everyone and not everyone, you know, if you have a squad of 16 young players at 13 to 14 years of age, I think it's nearly impossible for those 16 players just with the law of averages that they are going to excel and enjoy and, and there's going to be tough times with them and 
you will lose one or two of them. But I think I think as a coach then you also have a responsibility to communicate exactly and I think that's a big, big thing and that's where I I thought our communication channels were pretty good here, if I'm honest, before Donna came on board and then I realized that uh, they weren't. They were a lot of inadequate in a lot of ways. So um, you know, maybe a third party looks at your communication channels and sees whether they are or not. But I think you're, you have a responsibility to, to, to communicate exactly and be clear exactly what you want. And I think the two things, I think expectations are big. If people know their expectations, I think they're, they're not really people are, are consciously objective to a culture. Usually it's unconscious or subconscious, uh, which means um, they didn't really know what they were doing, which means you have to again, you have to repeat yourself almost every week, this is what we're going to be about. And second, I think it's feedback, I think it's just keeping that line open, listen, for a young player, like I, I would love body language to be addressed at the younger ages, I would love people to have communication with kids, and when they're, not even like if they lose games and throwing things away, but how to receive feedback, how to talk to coaches, how to look engaged, because when they get to uh, a, an older age group, that can sometimes be the difference between a player again, being consciously accepting feedback or subconsciously maybe just not really into it. And, and if that can be changed at a younger age group, I think it helps players. So it's it, hopefully what I'm trying to say is that if we can if we can shape players more psychologically and more mentally to prepare for uh, elite sport, I think we'll get a lot more out of them in the, in the next five to six years of their development. Cool, thanks, Gary. And we've got a few more questions. Are you okay to keep going with the? Uh, yeah, no problem. I've got time. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Okay, right. So there's there's literally four more. So um, so this one's from Derek, and it's a slight twist, but um, he's the director of coaching of the club. Uh, encourage our young players to participate in a variety of different sports, to be multi-sport to be multi-sport athletes. Um, what I'm finding difficult is creating that soccer-specific culture without encouraging young players to only focus on soccer. How can I do this without sacrificing that multi-sport athlete slash family? Oh, wow. Deep stuff there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I would say that the majority of, I mean, if, if I went back to the to the core principles of our, our culture, and even right now, um, not a lot of them are, are directly applicable to um, soccer. A lot of them are applicable to life and and I think if you can you know if you can get a kid say for example if a young player is playing um, football and their American football or rugby and soccer and they're looking at which one to do and they're playing both you know I think if you can get that player to train at their maximum in a contact sport and look after their body and eat the right foods and take on accept praise accept criticism whatever it is and I think that player will will come back to you as a as a better player, and I think sometimes we we view soccer as like if they're not missing, if they're not uh, you know if they're not getting better as a soccer player, if they're not touching the ball or they're not technically getting better, then they're getting worse. But sometimes if a player steps away, even our players our players we won't see them again on the soccer field till February, and that's three months. But our players. Are going to be in the gym, and that might be a that might be an area where an unconfident player can get more comfortable and see gains and come on to the, you know, a physical strength may transfer into a strength on the field. So I don't think it's anything to be afraid of, but I would say that you know, in in, in you know, genuine culture of of trying to to be like I said, that the, if, if your culture relies on accountability. It invariably relies on you being all you know the best version of yourself. That should be the best version of yourself in every sport. And if the kid, uh, young enough or whatever, sees that and sees growth, then if you're the one that opens the door or opens that that young player's eyes, I think that that puts a lot of value in that young player, and that young player will eventually walk away from another sport and come to you and, and hopefully want to play soccer for the rest of their life or young days. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, so one, three to go um, from David. Um, at what age group and ability level do you recommend going into the specific tactical advice uh, through the video you showed on Coach Logic? Um, yeah, good question. Um, probably, you know, I would say at 14, 15, 16, um, 
over in, in the US, I think we can be a bit more. I mean, everyone is. Uh, let me let me rephrase that. I think the way we're teaching it, I think we're having these conversations anyway. At, when they go to eleven v eleven, they're having that there's those discussions. Um, I would I would like ourselves to reevaluate how we are teaching that there and uh, how we're looking at these questions or looking at these tactical shapes because it's very rigid, and and that's what we're finding at the college like. Everything everyone wants to know. It's called a formation. Like we we don't we try to ban. I try to ban that word in our program because a formation to me means it's just static. It's inflexible. But as soccer's becoming, like you're going to have to be flexible. You're going to so a, a playing system is not a set system. It can be just principles playing from the back. And and if you look at Chelsea, I mean they they've switched from a four to a three. They'll probably switch back to a four again at some stage of the season. But they're always going to play the same way, I think, when they when they work the ball into their centre forwards or into their three forwards. So, um, I would like players to, to get exposure to that at a younger age, and and then those soccer conversations that happen at 16, 17, 18 can be a little bit more flexible, uh, because they have a, a broader base of knowledge rather than this is what a 4-3-3 looks like, this is what a 4-4-2 looks like, and when they play each other, this is what's going to happen. And and that goes for coach education as well. Like I think the game is is becoming a lot more flexible, and we have to shape our young players' minds to become flexible rather than it's all down to the coaches. Cool. Thanks. There was a there was a slight follow up to that question from David actually as well, Gary. Just um, alternatives for doing that to video, um, without having if you don't have the resources to video the games. So you've got that app that you use for junior sort of tactical uh, yeah. animation. What's that called? Uh, that is, look at it right here, um, <clears throat> what's he, he's tacked, it's not tacked foot, tacked foot's the other one, um, but we, we can send through that maybe. Pad, yeah, tactical pad, it's a, only like a three dollar, three dollar app or, or something like that there and that's what, that's what a lot of, a lot of what I tried to do was, was, I mean I've, I've tried a lot of apps to try and communicate that one there is the, is the best app that I had for moving pieces, um, and again, I, I didn't want to talk. Up, I didn't want to give players presentations with 25 arrows through it. So the fact that I can move that there, but I would recommend that it's it's pretty simple and, and pretty inexpensive. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, so just a couple to go then. Uh, first one from Joel is going back to something you mentioned earlier about the roles of the assistant coaches. He's asking why do you keep some distance as a head coach? Because uh, I got to make decisions that are based on, I think, uh, I make tough decisions based on maybe players will not be too happy about, which is based on team selection, and uh, and I also like to, I'm very conscious, and it's just me personally. I don't think there's like, there is coaches that are that are more hands on than I am. I and I we just had this conversation with with Clifton there the other day about maybe being a bit more hands on, and I think as I would be very conscious and very careful to be too much to the players, and that's like I think if you're if you're in there too much, you shape the culture. Uh, you can almost cause players to be withdrawn and restrict. I want people to be comfortable, uh, and to be comfortable, I feel that you have to, as a coach, you know, let them be themselves and not. And I I would hate for our players to think that they're judged every day they walk in as people, and I I want them to be themselves, and and so I I try to take a back seat in that there, um, and then I also then use then I would say then that time to to do a little more one v one stuff, but again it's not uh, it's just me personally, and and it's something that that I might look at changing uh, in the next couple of years or even sooner than that. Excellent. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Last, very last question, and Joe, uh, Joe managed to sneak this one through because he started it by saying a great webinar. <laughs> <laughs> that always wins, wins prizes. But, um, so he's saying he, he currently coaches an under-15 girls team that are full of uh, alpha females. Um, any recommendations on how to help team captains learn how to earn the trust of their teammates? Oh. Yeah, I mean, you're first of all, you're lucky if you've got if you've got players who want to step up and be competitive. Uh, you know, it's it's a great great thing to have because there's I think uh, if you ask a lot of college coaches, uh, they'll tell you that it's not as natural now as it used to be, and people 
are maybe again withdrawing a bit of that competitiveness. So if you have people who are naturally competitive, oh, embrace it and uh, compliment them for it and have them go for more and, and try to get more out of it. But I suppose then if you're talking about, and, and I might be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds as if you're saying, well, how do we get them to be a bit more closer to the team and connect with the team? Um, and if that's the case, then I think communication and Again, that's what Donna Fischer is always telling us. Like, if you can get the everything relies on, you know, everyone. If, if silence can be deafening in a team, and silence can create um, assumptions that are usually false, and you know, and, and she thought that of me, or he thought that of him. And I think if if uh, if you're grooming players to become captains, I think you've got to groom them to be uh, influence and impact more than yelling and screaming, because I think. You know, even in today's day and age, there doesn't seem to be that yell and screaming, doesn't seem to be anywhere on the field. But the great captains are people that have a, a great influence, and that influence can sometimes come by 20 1v1 conversations rather than one conversation to 20 people, which is not going to hit everyone. And I think that's the same for coaches as well. I think the better than we are in 1v1 situations, um, then the stronger the relationships are going to be, and the more players appreciate that. And, that's certainly something that we're trying to do here is, is strengthen those there and um, and we're going to continue to try and do that for sure. Excellent. Really good. Well, thanks uh, thanks very much for that, Gary. Uh, no that was That was really, yeah, really insightful uh, and a great a great listen and great for you to share so much as well. I think um, certainly from our point of view, I think people sharing uh, amongst their sort of peer group or outside their peer group is really important to, to really sort of help raise standards within or out with the, the sport that you're involved in. So, yeah, thanks very much for taking the time. No really worries. appreciate it. Thanks to all the guys who uh, sent in questions and obviously have spent the time uh, listening to Gary as well. Uh, the, I sent through the message to you guys. Hopefully you got that about the, the Tactics app, which is called Tactical Pad. Uh, just about to send a quick message as well about Coach Logic. So if anyone is interested in that, then you can just head to coach-logic.com. You can get a little free trial, but yeah, I think all it leaves is just again to thank Gary very much for that, and uh, yeah, we'll all keep in touch. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.